what are the major functions of melatonin, particularly in the gut? Well, obviously I want to come back to pineal gland. That's what most people are familiar with, but set of curiosity in the gut, what are some of the major functions? You know, that's an interesting question. And I feel like even though the most amount of melatonin is actually produced in the gut, I feel like we don't know as much as to why that is the case. Just like we don't, I don't think we fully understand why there's so much serotonin in the gut or why there are all these neurotransmitters in the gut outside of the sheer fact that anatomically and physiologically speaking, the gut has that gut-associated lymphoid tissue. It's got smooth muscle. It has uh, an endocrine aspect to it. So, you know, and it's large. So it's going Mm -hmm. to produce a lot. But why is it produced there? Well, there are a couple of different um, ideas around that. One of them is that it may have a role in motility. So there might be some aspect there. There is some more, I would say, emerging research to suggest that melatonin in the gut might actually be modulating the gut microbiome, which Mm kind of makes sense. I mean, what doesn't modulate the gut microbiome, right? It's like any of these signals coming in. But there was a very intriguing study in which um, they were looking, this was specifically in animals, and showing that when the mothers were given melatonin, it helped to shape the gut microbiome of the offspring, so in early life. So there's some aspect here that might be connected to modulation of the gut microbiome, gut motility, perhaps even some of the secretions of the gut. But I don't think we fully understand the localized effect of melatonin. And the difference here too between the gut and the pineal gland is that the gut doesn't produce melatonin in response to darkness like the pineal gland. It seems to be a response to things like meals or a postprandial effect. But I think that again, there is that gut-brain connection. Perhaps there's more than we fully understand here. So I'm just yeah, going to say that there, well, there's more. <laughs> we know melatonin plays an important role in the immune system. And yes. so you have, what's 80% of your immune system in your gut with the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. So it makes sense that it would be have some sort of role there in uh, you know the communication process. That's a really good point. In fact, that's kind of what piqued my interest in melatonin some years ago, is that you know with all of the discussion of viruses and COVID and whatever else, there started to be discussion around Mm. melatonin. And I was thinking, why is this? You know, I'm used to talking about vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, you know, the steady eddies, but I wasn't, I I just didn't know enough enough about melatonin, but now I can see that there's clearly an interrelationship for the reason that you just mentioned, that from an immune system activity perspective, there could be an interrelationship. And you do find melatonin within the immune system. Just even the individual players of the immune system do connect into melatonin. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at melatonin levels and its relationship, if there's any sort of relationship with secretory IgA right? And some of the major yeah. immune components in the gut. That's a really good question. Um, I, I'd like to know with that COVID, too. Because secretory IJ is also in your all your epithelial tissue, all your mucus tissue. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good uh, a really good point. And probably there there is. It's just that I think a lot of the nuance between melatonin and a lot of these different dynamics, they haven't been so clearly delineated yeah. like they have been with the circadian rhythm and sleep. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, most of us, when we think about melatonin, And I know for me, for probably up until maybe a few years ago, I just thought about melatonin as our sleep hormone, right? And its impact on the pineal gland. Can you give an overview of that? And then um, let's talk about what happens with a melatonin imbalance. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the pineal gland. The pineal gland is in the brain. It is a true endocrine gland. So the way that melatonin is secreted by the pineal gland is that the eyes, we have very specific types of cells within the retina. So the eyes have to perceive darkness or this absence of, of blue light. So we we start to see that as it becomes dimmer throughout the day, what ends up happening is that the retinal cells respond to that and then send a signal to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is in the brain, which is then eventually talking to the pineal gland to create that that catalyst of uh, of that conversion between tryptophan, serotonin, and then melatonin. And then that melatonin that is produced is then circulated systemically in order to key into cellular clock genes in order to synchronize the body systems to circadian rhythm. 
So that's essentially what melatonin is doing. And that's why when people think of it for sleep, they think, oh, melatonin is uh, helping me to sleep. What melatonin is actually doing is it's signaling the darkness to cue the brain to start to synchronize with that diurnal rhythm. So it's a, a synchronizer, it's connecting the clock genes, and what melatonin is good at as it relates to sleep is getting you to sleep, but not always staying asleep, right? Mm. And many people think that melatonin is supposed to be solving all of their sleep woes, but that's not actually how it's working or intended to work, or even how it just naturally is produced in the body. Yeah, let's talk, talk a little bit more about that. So you're saying it helps you get to sleep, but not necessarily stay asleep. Is that because your melatonin levels start to drop as the night goes on? Well, we do. So as it's dim, so let's just imagine like your typical day, it starts to get dim at about 6 p.m. And and with that level of dimness, as that rises, mm. your melatonin rises. And then you you produce the the most amount of melatonin from your pineal gland between you know, somewhere between 2 and 4 a.m. at that pinnacle of darkness, right? So that melatonin is not just allocated for sleep and circadian rhythm. We're actually doing a lot of cleanup at night. So when I think of the morning, I think of, okay, we're in our young, we're in our active phase, cortisol, testosterone, we're moving, we're doing stuff. At night, we start to see this increase, especially at around that 2 a.m. spot, where we start to see that certain enzymes change. So things like glutathione peroxidase or even uh, superoxide dismutase, you know, catalase is up, uh, glutathione goes up. And so it seems that melatonin is in concert with a lot of these different antioxidant defense enzymes. And this is when I'm sure that most listeners will will know about this, that we have that brain detoxification that happens mm -hmm. through the glymphatic fluid. So that glymphatic fluid flux, which is so important for the release of things like amyloid peptides or metabolites, hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, anything that needs to come out of the brain can only do so when we're not active and engaged. So we have to be sleeping. And as it turns out, what we see from some of the research that's been done on melatonin and the glymphatic fluid is that there seems to be a relationship between melatonin, perhaps serving as a transporter of some of that waste from the brain, or at least being implicated in some aspect of that process. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we know that proteins basically run everything in our body and oxidation or rusting is what damages a protein. So mm -hmm. just, just our daily life, we end up with these damaged proteins and then we've got to neutralize them and, and basically eliminate them. And so melatonin is a part of that that whole process of helping neutralize and eliminate them. And what's interesting is the brain actually gets more metabolically active at night while we're sleeping. Yes. Yes. And that's why sleep is so important because yeah. uh, it, it's recalibrating, you know, that's our rest and digest. And it's, it's, it's digesting thoughts. It's digesting memories. It's a lot in the, the mental mm -hmm. sphere. And some of the other research on melatonin would suggest that it acts as a neuroprotective nerve growth factor. So mm -hmm. during the night when we're sleeping, it's not just that we're clearing waste. We're actually creating the space to generate new neurons. So these neurotropic like effects of melatonin, I think, are really intriguing. There's an, a very interesting article by Dr. Russell Ryder, who is one of the premier researchers in melatonin and has been for many decades. And he calls it brainwashing, you know, not, not the kind that would be undesirable, but the right, kind right. that is desired. You know, we yeah. want that kind of brainwashing, right? And for so long, you know, talking about detoxification and, you know, we often think of liver, gut, kidney, skin, lungs, you know, this, the, the general um, aspects of detox, but the brain detoxifies. And it's thought that at nighttime during sleep, through the help of melatonin and some of these other compounds, which seem to be working in concert, that that is happening. So, yeah. you know, when, when people say, and I, I don't know if you've seen this as well with clients, is that. You know, many times people will say, well, I wake up at 2 a.m. You know, yeah. it's like that 2 a.m. wake up club. Why is that? Yeah, that's so, a good, good question, right? Yeah. And could be I a think number of they're... things. Blood sugar could be an issue, right? Like they might yes. not have the right sleep hygiene. Um, there's a number of things. 
there can be a number of things. Thank you for for chiming in on that. You're right. Yeah. So many different root causes. Uh, it could be hormonal. So mm. in perimenopausal women, you know, when you have upregulated inflammation and a lot of those wake up times, it could be related to physiology and just needing to to use the the restroom, you know, or it could be pain. It could be, like you said, fasting, mm. uh, blood sugar could be really low. And so there can be a lot of those different reasons. What I think is really interesting, though, is that if you look at the traditional Chinese medicine chronotherapy and you look at the different organ mm. times, so there are two-hour blocks that they see as allocated to certain organ systems. And between 1 and 3 a.m. is allocated to the liver. Yeah. And so this is in my own mind, right? This is no science. This is just kind of thinking through everything. If... 1 to 3 a.m. is liver time, at least in traditional Chinese medicine. And we know that between 2 and 4 a.m. is when you see the peak spike of all of these different types of detoxifying hormones. It kind of feels like, well, if somebody had a lot of activity going on here, a lot of inflammation, you know, whether they're perimenopausal, uh, they've got some health condition that's compromising them. I mean, they might actually have a lot of activity where it could get... A little bit unsettling there could be some some sleep upset because of that right so i when yeah. i'm thinking of that 2 to 4 a.m wake up i'm thinking how's the detoxification system mm. how's the liver and the liver is keyed into those clock genes pretty closely in fact when you look at all of the different clock genes and where is the largest concentration and the greatest degree of oscillations it's actually the liver the liver sets the stage. So isn't that interesting? Just kind of how, yeah. you know, we need to detoxify. So when can we do it at night? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And I'm glad that you brought that up as far as the liver having those clock genes, because, you know, we have a central circadian rhythm, which is more or less like telling us when to sleep, right. Or when to have energy. And then we have a peripheral, uh, yeah. kind of a peripheral circadian rhythm that is in all of our cells, basically right? It's being impacted. I mean, there, there's some level of communication there in all the cells of our body. Yeah. It's like an intelligence that's connected to that of nature. Mm -hmm. And so when people are out of alignment, so this is when things go out of whack, when seasons change, um, shift work, jet lag, you know, we start to change up the circadian rhythm. And so like, even for people that think that they're engaging in really healthy activities, but they're doing it at night under fluorescent lighting. Mm. You know, I even think about people that go to the gym really late or they're in a library very late or at a sporting event. You know, all of that artificial light at night, it's called ALAN. It's really acting as an endocrine disruptor. So mm. I think we do need to be thinking about what exactly what you said, kind of like that centralized clock system through the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the peripheral, how is the liver working? And why can things be just thrown off? It's because we're not in alignment for some reason. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people are dealing with melatonin imbalances. I know I've, I've heard you talk about darkness deficiency as yeah. well. Let's talk about some of that, some of those issues. Well, and there's another phrase I'd like to bring out for everybody. It's melatonopause. I was on a podcast with Dr. Dickon Weatherby, and as we were yeah. talking about all of the situations where melatonin can be low, and I was describing how children, children pre-puberty, have mm. the highest levels of endogenous melatonin that they're going to have their whole lives. And then as they go through puberty and um, just young adulthood, those levels start to come down. By the time you're in your 50s, you're really low. By the time you're in your 60s, it's just bottomed out. So he was saying that that sounded like melatonopause, which I thought was very creative of him. Yeah, for and sure. And it does parallel other hormones, right? So yeah, it makes sense. But there can be other things that can prematurely bring down our endogenous melatonin. So I'll list a couple of those. I already mentioned the artificial light at night. So wearing those blue light blocking glasses, which I have all by yeah. my computer. Right now, it's like midday, so I don't need them. We can have that blue enriched light. But the moment, again, it's dark outside and we're not keyed into that darkness, mm. then it starts to look like, you know, we have an overabundance of light. We can call it light excess or darkness deficiency. Either way you cut it, you know, I, I think that we're very tuned into sunlight and I don't think that human beings have tuned into darkness. Many times humans mm. fear darkness. They don't want to be in the dark. They're working later. Um, you know, it just feels more comfortable to have more 
electric light all around. But this is damaging ecosystems on the planet. And you can even see the earth from afar, all of the different photographs over time, and you can see how illuminated it is. So this is darkness deficiency, and this is impacting us at the level of our endocrine system, which as you clearly mentioned, we're impacting all of the cells that are keyed into this. And then we start to go off rhythm. So I, I think that this has implications for immune disorders, uh, autoimmunity. You can see low melatonin status with conditions that would tie into neurodegeneration, whether type 2 diabetes can be um, implicated with low melatonin levels, or even looking at, um, you know, any hormonal disturbance. Like even if we looked at polycystic ovarian syndrome, when we look at um uh, changed androgens and insulin. There's also some changes with melatonin. So anytime you're tugging at the hormone web, you're creating this ripple, ripple through effect of changing melatonin. So if you're stressed and your, your cortisol levels have changed in some way, then you're changing melatonin. So as you could see, there would be implications for many different factors that could change melatonin in one's body.